probably going back to the 1980s, I started to be concerned with how it would be possible to use computer technology to have an integrated system of economic planning for society which wasn't based on money but was based on real resource requirements and labour time. So it was a time and resource method of calculating things. We're entering into something which hasn't happened in the last 10,000 years, which is a deglaciation. Think of what the threats are. The first threat is going to be a threat to food supplies. There's going to be very substantial reductions in crop yields in some of the key areas for human habitation. So that requires planning to shift the composition of the diet that we have and which cannot be left to the free market. It actually requires regulation of the amount of meat that's going to be produced. Essentially meat rationing so that smaller quantities are produced and the available resources of basic um, photosynthetically fixed carbon that could be used to feed people are not being used to feed animals. We're going to lose the main fuel resource on which industrial society has been based. We need to substitute for that on a large scale. My own view is that it's impossible to do that without a combination of things like solar, wind and nuclear power. I don't think it, it's at all realistic of the green movement in Europe to think you can do without nuclear power. The, it means the phasing out in the very short term of the use of fossil fuel vehicles. Now the IPC has, IPCC has given us essentially 15 years to stop fossil fuel use. And the target period Scottish government and other governments are using is far too long for that. China has already got something like 600,000 electric buses in service. And they've done that in just a few years. Whole of Europe has got about 3,000 electric buses. Now the difference is China has a largely state-controlled economy and the state can set planning directives for the transition to a post-fossil fuel economy and they're acted on. Can you continue having a national gas grid fed by methane? You have to set targets for the year in which you're going to turn off the gas supply. You can't stop continue building houses which have gas central heating. You have to start converting all the houses to electric uh, storage heating. Scotland is in a particularly hypocritical situation in that although the government says it intends to become carbon neutral, it's not proposing to close down the oil industry. If it really wanted to make a, a difference, the biggest difference would be to turn off the taps coming from North Sea oil. Large areas of Europe are going to become so hot that the forest fires are going to be very frequent. If it continues, the climate in these areas is going to approach Saharan climate. Now, this Australian summer, large areas of Australia hit temperatures of 45 degrees, but that was enough to kill off a lot of wild mammals. We're talking actually about, when I say fire, I'm not just meaning forest fire, I'm meaning the danger of heat just to human survival. When you consider the land loss that Europe experienced at the end of the last glacial, when the great plains of the North Sea were flooded, when the British Isles became an island, and you project forward, you see shrinking coastlines, and you have to prepare for the continuous rise and continuous move inland, and you have to start moving people out of coastal cities and building cities well inside. Now, these are things which sound drastic, but the Chinese have been able to shift half the population from the countryside to cities, entirely newly built cities, and they've done that in maybe 30 years. These things can be done, but they can't be done unless it becomes state policy and directive state policy 
of a sort which we haven't seen in Britain since the 1940s. Every economic transaction is digitally recorded. Every time you buy an individual item from a shop, the barcode is scanned. So the information is captured on all the flows of, of products. If we set a constraint that the economy as a whole must not exceed a certain energy use, a certain carbon use, and a certain population use, a certain number of people available, you can then solve an optimal structure of the economy if you have this, this input-output information. If we restructure the economy away from one form into another, you need to know what the capital goods requirements in these sectors are going to be. We don't have the data on that. That data exists, but it's held by private firms and is not collected as published statistics. We're not going to get through this kind of crisis without the kind of state direction of the economy that existed in wartime. People are grossly underestimating what's going to be required and underestimating the degree of state direction that's going to be required. If you are going to restructure the economy to have a different energy base, a different fuel base and different production techniques, it's going to require a lot of capital investment. The current distribution of the labour force is going to have to change with many more people working in physically making things to build the, the, the infrastructure. These are things which are not initially palatable to the public, but if you think that you're faced with a, a crisis or an emergency, eventually people will realise they have to accept this.